Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is focused on the book of Ephesians. And this lesson, the second in this series for July 8 of 2023 is entitled God's Grand Christ-Centered Plan. Well, that'll be interesting to study about. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have taken the opportunity once again to gather around this table to discuss you, to think about what you've done and what you did through your friend Paul. Help us to understand it better as a result of this discussion than others may share as well. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So what is God's grand plan? This lesson focuses on, and this is from our Bible study guide, how Paul teaches the Ephesians and us to count our blessings, not the blessings we think are important, we think are important, but the real blessings humanity needs so desperately. God, Paul emphasizes, gives these blessings to us in Christ. In Christ, we have been chosen and accepted by God. We are His and He is ours. God treasures and regards us as His inheritance and we treasure and regard him as our inheritance. In Christ, we have been given and re we have been forgiven and redeemed in Christ. We receive God's supreme plan of salvation. In Christ, humanity has its only chance at immunity and harmony. In Christ, we live full of joy and praise. Because of Christ, we receive God's seal and a foretaste of eternal salvation. Because of Christ, we may receive the presence and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God's gifts are spiritual pri primarily in the sense that the Holy Spirit gives them to us. The Holy Spirit brings these gifts to us from the very realms of heaven. All these riches are God's gift to us all because we do not and cannot work to meet them, to merit them, I'm sorry. It is God who gives these gifts to us freely out of his heart full of love for us. All who accept these gifts, God predestines to be sealed and to taste beforehand the eternal blessings of his kingdom. Jim, I'm going to ask you to pick up that next section there. The lesson theme, this lesson highlights three major themes. In Christ, God lavished on us many gifts, election, adoption, redemption, forgiveness, joy of salvation, unity and harmony of of humanity and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit as God's down payment for what is yet to come when Christ will return. Our response to God's precious, gracious gifts is a life of praise and adoration in and for Christ. In the Holy Spirit, we experience a foretaste of our future eternal life from the Bible study guide. Okay, here's a question for you. We have been looking at the possibility of moving. We love our house, it's very nice, but my wife is having a little bit more trouble all this time getting up and down a long set of stairs. And so we're going through these steps to consider the possibility of moving. Now, suppose that I told you that I can offer you free a house made out of pure gold, the streets will be of gold, you can have any kind of gems that you want fixed to it anywhere you want. You will live forever. How much would you be willing to pay for that house? But it's free. <laughs> it's free. It's free. I mean, do we really stop and think about it's free? Mm. <laughs> well, Jennifer, you want to pick up that next one? Sure, from the Bible Study Guide, 25 years after becoming the first person to walk on the moon, Neil Armstrong wrote a thank you note to the creative team who designed the spacesuit, the Extravehicular Mobility Unit, EMU, <laughs> in which he took those historic steps, calling it, quote, the most photographed spacecraft in history, <laughs> end quote, and teasing that it was successful at hiding, quote, its ugly occupant from view. Armstrong thanked the 
EMU gang at the Johnson Space Center for the tough, reliable, and almost cuddly suit that preserved his life, sending them a quarter century's worth of thanks and congratulations. Paul begins his letter to the Ephesians with a majestic thank you note, praising God for the blessings he has poured out, blessings as essential to the lives of believers as a spacesuit is for someone who walks on the moon. Mm -hmm. Paul argues that God has been at work on these essential blessings since, quote, before the foundation of the world, end quote from Ephesians 1.4, and praises God for working through the ages on behalf of believers. Wow. I think about if you go to 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 11, you will see everything that Paul had been through within an inch of his life so many times or whatever. And here he is praising God for what God has done for him. Yeah. Who, who can I, can I line somebody up to give me a beating so that I can praise God? <laughs> I mean, just amazing. It's, it's similar to like the gratefulness research that they have, just finding things to be grateful for despite the challenges. Yeah. It's very <laughs> So what kind of a list would you make of the blessings you have received from God? Considering that he was writing from house arrest in Rome, waiting to be executed, Paul began his letter to the Ephesians, not as you might expect. In instead, he began with a list of blessings that he considered to be far more important than his imminent fate. That house arrest, I'm sure you've been there. Is this the place underground? Just that's outside the, of that that's the place where he imp was imprisoned the second time. Okay. This is the first imprisonment. Okay. They actually allowed him a little bit because people came. He actually evangelized the, the Roman guards and but so forth. But not in the second place that he was under I, the... That was, that was a very different place. Yes. I don't think he was there for long. I think. By that point in time, Nero said, we got to get rid of this guy. Keep him there for a short time, put him in trial and cut his head off. You're speaking of the Mamertine prison. Yeah. Underground. Right. Yeah. 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 Right in Rome. Yeah. Reading from Ephesians yeah. 1, verses 3 to 14. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for in union with Christ, he has blessed us by giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ so that we would be holy and without fault before him. You want to, let's do a little break up here. These, some of these quotations are fairly lengthy. Charles, you want to take the next paragraph there? I've been a bad boy. I went, went back to a statement. If I could read okay. that one, if you allow me to. Okay. That's on page one. By the way, going to Adventist schools, we dealt with predestination. And this is Ellen White. Uh, Jane was reading uh, to the last part of the paragraph. All who accept these gifts, comma, God predestines to be sealed and to taste beforehand the eternal blessings of his kingdom. Yeah. That's a beautiful statement. Yeah. He wants us to feel like we're already in heaven. There you are. Yeah. Amazing. Those who accept. Yes. Those who accept he predestines, that, that's so beautiful. I just had to go back there. Yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe, Gordon, like... you better continue on there. <laughs> okay, because of his love, God had already decided that through Jesus Christ, he would make us his sons and daughters. This was his pleasure and purpose. Let us praise God for his glorious grace, for the free gift he gave us in his dear son, for by the blood, and in the footnote, by the blood or by, his or by the sacrificial death of Christ, we are set free. This, that is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God, which he gave to us in such measure. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already com decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. Let me interrupt now. And Charles, you can start yes, reading sir. the next paragraph in just a moment. In this passage, there's something suggested which I hadn't even thought about before. He says, 
and I think this interpretation is correct, by the gift of the Holy Spirit that we are supposed to receive at the time of baptism, that's a first payment toward what God plans to give us for the rest of eternity. That's very interesting. Very, a down payment. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Love that. Yeah, verse 13. And you also became... We'll start God's back in 11. Back in 11. All things are done according to God's plan and decision. And God chose us to be His own people in union with Christ because of His own purpose based on what He had decided from the very beginning. Let us then, who were the first to, to hope in Christ, praise God's glory. And you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought your salvation. You salvation. You believed in Christ and God put His stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit He has promised. The Spirit is the guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised His people. And this assures us that God will give complete freedom to those who are His. Let us praise His glory. Amen. Try to imagine Paul, probably with chains on at least one arm and attached to a Roman soldier, writing those words. Of course, the good news is really about how God relates to us and not about how we relate to Him. Paul used the expression in heavenly places in several verses in Ephesians. It is only in, Ephe only in Ephesians that this expression is used. What does it mean? Well, let's look at some examples. In Ephesians, the phrase in the heavenly, or in the heavenly places and in the heavens or in heaven or, or point to heaven as the dwelling place of God. So that's one use. It suggests that we're talking about the dwelling place of God. Um, and it gives a lot of references to the location of spiritual powers. Ephesians 1, 10, 20, 21, Ephesians 3, 10, 15, Ephesians 6, 20 and to the location of Christ's ex exaltation at the right hand of the Father, Ephesians 1.20. And so we're seeing here that Paul is saying the Holy Spirit was given to you as just the down payment of what, is of what God is planning to give you. And you want to know how that's going to work out? Well, look at what happened to Christ. He lived his life. He died, or Jesus died. And then he was resurrected and taken to heaven and seated at the right hand throne of God. That's what God wants to do for every one of you. Mm. Wow. And to the location of Christ's exaltation at the right hand of the Father. Believers have access to these heavenly places in the present as a sphere where spiritual blessings are offered through Christ. And more passages. Though the heavenly places have become a place of blessing for believers, they are still the location of conflict from evil powers that contest the Lordship of Christ. And what he's really referring to there is, where did the great controversy start? In, in God's throne room in heaven. Okay, that's from our Bible study guide. The plan of salvation, which we perhaps selfishly think is just about us, is really about saving or even salvaging God's reputation against the accusations of Satan, which were started in the herring of, of the entire universe before this world was created. God's plan, of course, was for all of us to be living in the Garden of Eden. But he knew in advance what was going to happen. He realized that he would need to let it happen once and once only. Sin with, with its awful consequences does not need to be demonstrated more than once. Because why, how can we say that? God is going to keep a record, and it's going to be the discussion of the angels and us for the rest of eternity. Wow. But I thought my sins were buried at the depths of the ocean. Well, we'll see. <laughs> in, I've had in, people in struggle Bible, with it. In the Bibles, yeah. uh, the yes. sins of the saints will be preserved at least. Yes. Okay, well, Jim, you want to jump in there? Well, the writing is Ellen White that which alone can effectually strain us, 
excuse me, restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded by apo from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provided an eternal safeguard against the defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889. So a short time after the 1888 General Conference, but notice what she says, provides an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds. I have taken that and suggested something that I'd like you to think about, all of you out there. Suppose that when this whole sin thing is over, God begins to, to create beings in other worlds sometime again. There's no reason to think that he shouldn't. And suppose sometime in the future, one of those beings decides to rebel against God and start another great controversy. What I can imagine would happen is something like this. God would call that person here and say, sit down there. Let me show you what happened the last time somebody tried that rebellion. So he gets to see the whole story of planet Earth. And at the end, if the person still wants to go his rebellious way, God would simply call all of us who have been through the great controversy around in a big circle. And here he is standing there and God is standing next to him. And God says, what do you think I should do? And we would say, just step back and leave him. And what happens when God leaves us? We perish. Cease to exist. John Donne, on falling out of God's hand. Yes. There's no hope. We're done. Yeah. But, but the, also, this, the marks will always be on the hands of Jesus Christ and his feet and his side. Always. He, he doesn't yes. need, he never needs to do it again. Right. One time was enough. Right. Museum of sin. Yes. yes you are. At the wedding of Cana in Galilee, Jesus performed his first known miracle, turning water into pure grape juice. I wish I could taste some of that. Mm -hmm. He did that, uh, by the way, I was, <laughs> when I say that, I, memories pop up in my mind. Uh, if I could make a quick comment, yeah. we have the time. I wish the scriptures were re uh, translated in English and also other parts of the world, that this was freshly pressed grape juice and not wine. Yeah. Because every Bible you read, it says wine. and. Okay. Uh, one third of the world's population say, you Christians, you're drinking wine. I have to deal with this when I'm, yeah. you see, so. Okay, uh, let me help sure. you. The word oinos in Greek means everything from fresh grape juice all the way to fairly fermented grape juice. And you have to decide in the context what is meant. It, that one word stands for that whole. Now, there is another word for really, really severely fermented. It's not that. But there is a, that word oinos means fresh grape juice. It can mean all the way to. And the reason is because they didn't have refrigeration. How about William Carey? Uh, no, how about uh, the um, Hebrew? The word? The Hebrew. Well, it's the same in the Hebrew. Same in, same same in it, Hebrew. It's a different word. In, in Hebrew, the word is yayan. But it's, that also has a spectrum of... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have to decide. And in light of what the Bible says about drinking alcoholic beverages, what kind of, quote, wine do you think Jesus would make? That is correct. Wine is a mocker. Well, yeah. Yeah. Proverbs 31. Yeah. yeah. Is the wine to the poor so they can remember their poverty and not remember their poverty and, or their misery anymore. Yeah. That's a terrible paraphrase, but anyway. Luckily, William Carey, by the way, translated Bible into Bengali, mm -hmm. and he says, uh, freshly pressed grape juice. You really? Jesus said, yes, and I love it. To keep it that so way. Jesus did that after his mother had asked him to do something about the family in crisis. So, uh, Jennifer, I think that's yours. Yeah. 
Yeah, from Ellen G. White, The Desire of Ages, the words, mine hour is not yet come, point to the fact that every act of Christ's life on earth was in fulfillment of the plan that had existed from the days of eternity. Mm. Before he came to earth, the plan lay out before him, perfect in all its details. But as he walked among men, he was guided step by step by the Father's will. He did not hesitate to act at the appointed time. With the same submission, he waited until the time had come. Okay, think about this. God, and including Jesus Christ, had all this in view before he began the creation of this world. It was all laid out for him. He saw it. What kind of love does that tell us about? He could look down and he says, I'm going to be doing this on that day, and we're doing this on that day, and we're doing this on that day. Imagine Jesus, the King of the universe and the Lord of Lords, agreeing in advance, based on his foreknowledge, to all the things that happened to him on this earth. I mean, that's just amazing. Paul was writing to his friends in Ephesus and in all the churches around that area. He recognized that in that magnificent temple of Artemis in Ephesus, every kind of evil and immoral things were taking place. Sexual perversion was considered to be a kind of spiritual worship. I mean, I'm, that's an, you, take that for what it means. He described things going on there as being carried out by the spiritually dead. Mm. Gordon? Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. In the past, you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sins. At that time, you followed the world's evil way. You obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers in space, the spirit who now controls the people who disobey God. <clears throat> Actually, all of us were like them and lived according to our natural desires, doing whatever suited the wishes of our own bodies and minds. In our natural condition, we, like everyone else, were destined to suffer God's anger. Good News Bible. So God came down in the form of Jesus, the human Jesus, and offered us redemption. What does redemption mean? Ephesians 1, 7 and 8, For by the blood of Christ we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God, which he gave to us in such large measure. I wish we had time to go to places like uh, Hebrews 10 and other places like that, where it says, God does what? He just pretends like they didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Basically, it says like that. He says, he says, those things don't matter to him anymore. If we have turned from those evil things and we have chosen to follow his way for our lives, what happened before doesn't matter. So how does the death of Jesus cause our sins to be forgiven? The Greek word translated redemption in Ephesians 1, 7 is Apolutrosis, hmm. apolutrosis, they would pronounce it, originally used for buying a slave's freedom or paying to free a captive. Mm -hmm. One can hear echoed the voice of the slave trader auctioning his merchandise and the cold grinding of a slave's manacles. When the New Testament discusses redemption, it highlights the, the costliness of setting the slaves free. Our freedom comes at an extreme cost. That in him, that is in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, Ephesians 1, 7. The idea of redemption also celebrates God's gracious generosity in paying the high price of our liberty. God gave us our freedom and dignity. We are no longer enslaved. Mm. Quote, to be redeemed is to be treated as a person, not an object. It is to become a citizen of heaven rather than a slave of the earth from Alistair McGrath, what was God doing on the cross, etc. Quoted in our Bible study guide for Monday, July 3. Remember that as we have discussed before, the idea that God has to pay something to the devil to redeem us is a medieval idea. It is not a biblical idea. God does not owe Satan anything. Our Bible study guide says, where are we? That's Jim, I think that's yours. The benefits of Calvary also include the forgiveness of our trespasses, Ephesians 1, 7. On the cross, 
Christ takes upon himself the price of our sin, both past and future, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands, Colossians 2.14. In doing this work of redemption and forgiveness through Christ, God is acting as our generous Father with the riches of grace being lavished upon us, Ephesians 1.7. Okay, now let's ask the, the hard questions. How does Christ, quote, take upon himself the price of our sin, both past and future, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands? Now, let's, let's put this in stark reality. Christ died almost 2,000 years ago, getting close now, 2,000 years ago. How, did it, how could a death back in those days compensate or, or do something for my sins which I'm committing today? It didn't. Well, it does something. What, it, what does it? The question is not what it doesn't the do. Process, it was an education process. It had nothing to do with payments of penalty. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not, not arguing with that. That's, well, but all of this stuff here, what we're just reading here, uh, is... is both paragraphs 13 and 14 mm -hmm. and 15 uh, is just, it's, it's a mess. Here we find a conundrum or a paradox. Of ourselves and our natural sinful condition, we are really lost and worthless. However, then we remember that God claims us as his children. That makes us immensely valuable if we're willing to cooperate with them, with him. And obviously, God thinks we are valuable because look at the price he paid to give us back, to get us back. But this plan of salvation includes not just us on this world who respond to his love, but also it involves the entire universe. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, you get to read this paragraph again. Again, mm -hmm. yep, Ephesians 1, 8, B to 10. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will contemplate when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as head, from the Good News Bible. Okay, now, try to imagine yourself as the parent of a large family, and a big bunch of those kids have rebelled. They're so angry at you, they got so upset, they've left home, they're off somewhere. And yet you love them. What would you do? Isn't that what we have here? <laughs> God, wants, God wants all the children he could possibly reconcile with back in the fold. And that's what we're talking about here. Paul suggested in Ephesians 2.14 that for Christ himself has brought us peace by making Jews and Gentiles one people. With his own body, he broke down the wall that separated them and kept them enemies. By his death on the cross, Christ destroyed their enmity. By means of the cross, he united both races into one body and brought them back to God. Good News Bible. Okay, now, here's a place where we can try to get an idea of what all those other paragraphs that Jim was complaining about might mean. What does Paul see here? He sees when you really understand Christianity, you can go to church and sit down to anybody from any environment, from any race, from any culture and so forth, and worship together as brothers and sisters. That is what God is talking about. But you got to put that part of that uh, process, let this mind be in you as is in Christ Jesus. What Eternal life is to know Jesus and know the Father and Jesus Christ. I've accomplished the work it gave me to do. I've made known your character. John, uh, Romans, excuse me, uh, John uh, 17, three, verses 3 and 4. I mean, that's the essence of uh, what yeah. is needed to know. Yeah. And Jesus in John 16 was a, is the comforter was a lesson that he was giving. It wasn't another person coming down here and doing some magic hocus pocus that, that, that is referenced in par paragraphs 13, 14, and 15 there. And, and he doesn't say anything about hocus pocus. 
I, I know I did, but it is hocus pocus because it, it, yeah. it, this, the, 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 the record that's against us, that has nothing to do with it. God, it does, that is not true, Jim. The, your record of sins is against you. There is no question about it. Now, what it does about it, we could spend a long time discussing. But it is true that there's a record of sin against every one of us. And God has, a, the devil knows about that record and God knows about that record. And that's what gets discussed in the heavenly and, judgment. And, 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 and well, what, what in, in uh, Matthew 19, if you want to enter life, don't kill, don't steal, don't uh, uh, commit adultery, mm -hmm. don't bear false, false witness, uh, honor your parents. And what, what's the letter one? Anyway, yeah. if, you're doing the, if you're doing that way, Nobody is. If, but, but, nobody's but, going to keep but, a record or the, going to pay any attention is, to the record. The problem is that all those things are based on the ultimate sin, which it doesn't mention specifically, and that's selfishness and greed. And of course, none of us are guilty of any of those things, right? Well, everybody is. is, is okay, that's, so is there the, is a record of sin against every one of us. But, but the record, uh, now, the, does it really count for what anything? I, what I tried to say earlier, you maybe missed what I said, in places like Hebrews 10 and Jeremiah 31 in the Old Testament and so forth, it says, when we have come into union with Christ Jesus, with the Father again, he ignores those records. He says those things don't matter anymore. What matters now that is this person is now a child of mine. So, but the record is there. When Jesus says, I no, no longer call you slaves, but yeah. I call you friends. Friends is horizontal. Nobody is lo looking, may, 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 but whispering behind somebody else's back and, 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 yeah. and, and dredging up uh, things. The, the, <laughs> the records be kept, though, because the evil one demands. Yeah. So uh, this this is a legal well, transaction. No, it is so, not a legal transaction. Uh, that for sure it is not. Um, no. When, no. When Satan is involved. And, it, Satan has been demonstrated, what, 2,000 years ago, what, what happened with the cross. Yeah. It was that, that, that nobody needs to listen to, to the arguments of the adversary. Uh, but but it's, nevertheless, it's true that he has an accurate record of all the sins which he's caused us to commit. And that, it's, that's, that's Zechariah 3. It's right there in the Old Testament. So... Yeah, what the, what the, what the uh, father says, uh, put, put a, a, a new coat on Take it, the old take, things take away. It, toss it away. Yeah. 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 Paul goes on to suggest that God has a plan to make us all a part of his temple with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, Ephesians 2. Then Paul, Paul goes on to describe his own work in Ephesians 3. 7 through 10. I was made a servant uh, of the gospel by God's special gift, which um, he gave me through the working of his power. I'm less than the least of God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that all the present uh, at the present, present time by means of the church by means of the church the angelic rulers and the powers of the heavenly world might learn of the wisdom in all its different forms okay so what can the universe i mean the angels specifically who are standing around his throne what can they possibly learn about God from us? Don't everybody speak at the same time. <laughs> what not to do. <laughs> okay. Well, that's one way to put it. What, and a, a, another part of that, same thing is, they learn for the first time how God is going to respond if he has to deal with rebellion. Which is, that's the great controversy. Yeah. You remember that name, Emilio Kennecli. Yes. He used to say, no angel has stood by the grave of, grave of his dear son. Yeah. No one. But human beings do. 
Yeah. You see, so we are going to be special because we have, yeah. we have experienced this thing that uh, the angels can never wow. think about. Thank well, goodness they don't. What? Thank yeah. goodness they don't. Yeah. In the second half of Ephesians, Paul opened with a passionate plea, a call to unity. That would be mine. Ephesians 4, 1 to 16, I'll start it anyway. I urge you then, I who am a prisoner because I serve the Lord, live a life that measures up to the standard God set when he called you. Be always humble, gentle, and patient. Mm -hmm. Show your love by being tolerant with one another. Do your best to preserve the unity which the Spirit gives by means of the peace that binds you together. There is one body and one spirit, just as there is one hope to which God has called you. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one God and Father of all, who is Lord of all, works through all, and is in all. Each one of us has received a special gift in proportion to what Christ has given. As the scripture says, when he went up to the very heights, he took many captives with him. He gave gifts to people. And many people have discuss, discussed and discussed and discussed what that's talking about. It's probably talk about, talking about the people who are raised at his resurrection that he took to heaven with him. Mm -hmm. Now, what does he went up mean? It means that first he came down to the lowest depths of the earth. So the one who came down is the same one who went up above and beyond the heavens to fill the whole universe with his presence. It was he who, quote, gave gifts. He appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. By the way, um, the word apostles is Greek. Do you know what the word is in Latin? Mm. Missionaries. Mm. Mm. That's the word in Latin, missionaries. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God, we shall become mature people reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ who is the head. Under his control and different parts of the body fit together and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. Wow. Mm -hmm. Paul went all the way to, and that's from the Good News Bible, Paul went all the way to nearly the end of his book describing how we as humans should relate to each other. Husbands to wives, wives to husbands, children to parents, parents to children, even masters to slaves, even slaves to masters. Do we recognize the enormity of God's plan of salvation? Do we understand clearly how it impacted the rest of the beings in the universe? God's plan is for, is for us to be his future ambassadors. That's another word for missionary and apostle explaining what it meant to be saved or redeemed from the lost condition and sin. It should be clear to us why we, are, we all need to be rejoicing. Mm. So what is God's plan for us when we get to heaven? How will he treat us? Paul talked about us being given an inheritance by God. Jim? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11, 14, and 18. All things are done according to God's plan and decision, and God chose us to be his own people in union with Christ because of his own purpose, based on what he had decided from the very beginning. The Spirit is the guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised his people, his assurance, his and this assures us that God will give complete freedom to those who are his. Let us praise his glory. I ask that your minds may be open to see the light so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you, how rich you are, the wonderful blessings he has promised his people. Good wow. news Bible. So Paul here is sitting in prison in Rome, chained to a Roman soldier probably, and he's thinking, of the despicable things that were going on in that glorious temple 
of Artemis and Ephesians. At the same time, he's saying God's plan for you is to rise from those terrible things to be standing around the throne of God in heaven. Mm. Wow, think about the, I mean, talking about a gap. Mm. Okay, why do people receive an inheritance? Is it because they did something good? No. God has offered us the inheritance of eternal life, living with Him in heaven and then later back on the earth made new, not because of anything we did, but because He has won the great controversy, defeating the misrepresentations and accusations of Satan. In the Old Testament, God's people are sometimes referred to as being His heritage or inheritance. And an example is Deuteronomy 9, Deuteronomy 32, and Zechariah 2. So what is the difference between working to get something and inheriting it? In biblical times, things were identified as to their ownership by stamps. These stamps were often produced by imprinting a metal stamp, and we found some of those, a number of them, or we found the clay marks that, that came from those stamps. Uh, into, they would stamp it into wet clay and allow it to dry and harden. And Paul uses that example in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And you, and you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ, and God put His stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit He had promised. The Spirit is the guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised His people. And this assures us that God will give complete freedom to those who are His. Let us praise His glory. Good News Bible. And then by... Oh, oh, go ahead. No, no, um, Bible study guide. In ancient times, seals were used for a wide variety of functions, to authenticate copies of laws and agreements, to validate the excellence or quantity of a container's contents, uh, for example, Ezekiel 28, 12, or to witness transactions from Jeremiah 32 or 44. Contracts, letters, wills, and adoptions. And let me just interrupt there for a second. We have some an incredible collection of those stamps in a small room. Many of them came from a small room that was under the wall of Jerusalem that was burned at the time of Hezekiah, well, at the time they were, that the, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. And of course, you can imagine if these are clay, uh, little clay markings, and they were attached to probably either parchment or, or, or leather uh, rolls, the parchment and the leather burned, and the, any string or anything it was tying it to was burned. But the clay, what would happen to the clay? It just got harder and harder in that severe, in that hard, um, in the fire. So there was a whole stash of these things in what was probably some kind of a storage room or a small library or something like that. And we have things from Hezekiah, we have things from Isaiah. It's just amazing, these stamps that you're talking about. Wow. Go ahead. Imprinted on an object, a seal announced both ownership and protection. The presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives marks believers as belonging to God and conveys God's promise to protect them. Compare with Ephesians 4.30. They have been, quote, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That's from Ephesians 1.13. Okay, Gordon, maybe you can pick it up there. Paul plainly states that at the moment one gives his or her life to Jesus, and believes in Him, the Holy Spirit seals that believer in Christ for the day of redemption. Wonderful, liberating, and reassuring truth. The Spirit of God marked Christ's followers with a seal of salvation right when they f first believe. Uh, that's from uh, Misinterpreted End Time Issues, Five Myths of Adventism. Okay. The second image Paul uses for the Holy Spirit is that of quote, guarantee, end quote. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance, which looks toward the moment when the inheritance is to be given in full. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday. So remember, we talked about that earlier, uh, I think actually in our previous, last week's lesson. God says, okay, we have to live here on this earth. We can't go to heaven right now. But God has given us the Holy Spirit to give us a little bit of a taste of what it's going to be like to live in heaven for the rest of eternity. 
2 Corinthians 1, 22. Um, actually, <coughs> Charles, I guess that's yes. yours. It is God who has placed his mark of ownership upon us and who has given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the guarantee of all that he has in store for us, this Good News Bible. Uh, the word translated guarantee, Arabon? Yes. Okay, was a Hebrew word. Uh, loan that, word. Hebrew loan word. What's a loan word? It's loan. It means it's a, a word in one language that people, other people have found useful, so they used it in their language even though it's not their word. Okay that was used widely in the common coin yes, Greek, Koine Greek. of uh, New Testament times to indicate a first installment deposit or down payment that requires the payer to make additional payments. Not the believers do not pay that down payment, but receive it from God. So God is the one who's saying, I want to put my stamp on you. I claim you. I have plans for you. I put my stamp on you. My, this is my down payment. I have claims for you. That's what he's saying. The treasured presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers, says Paul, is the first installment of the full inheritance of salvation and redemption that will come in the, when Christ returns. Our job is to receive with a grateful and submissive heart we uh, what we have uh, been offered in Jesus Christ. Okay. Jesus Paul's rejoicing is recorded in Ephesians 1, 3 and 4 is based on the idea that God has provided a plan which every single person could take advantage of and be eternally a child of God. So nobody will be turned away by God. If people turned away, it, who, who's doing it? They're doing it to themselves. Thus, it is not a case of God deciding each person's fate arbitrarily. God loves each one of us more than our human parents love us. He wishes that he could save every single person, even the devil. However, the, he cannot admit to heaven those who will want to start the great controversy all over again by their selfish behavior and I, attitudes. I think I need to make a quick um, comment. When we are saved, we do not lose our power of choice. No. Never, until the day we close our eyes. So if I'm sealed, yes, I can unseal myself. I can yeah. say, I don't want well, your grace anymore. God doesn't so, turn us into robots. That's uh, it's misunderstood all across Christendom. Yeah. God's forgiveness and redemption are freely offered to anyone who is willing to cooperate in the salvation plan. Paul was imprisoned in Rome probably in a house for which he was paying the rent while being chained to a Roman guard. Philippians tells us that some of those guards became Christians. Mm. Paul says, believe it or not, <laughs> some people from the, from the family of, the, uh, from Caesar's, fam Caesar's household, he's Caesar's household, which probably not his immediate relatives, but uh, some of the people who worked for him or whatever. It is interesting to notice that while Nero sat on the throne, Considering himself to be the ruler of the world, Paul referred to Jesus as Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord, Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, or simply Christ, or the Lord, many times in Ephesians. He was not recognizing Nero as being of any authority, even though Nero was the one who finally condemned him to have his, his head cut off. That's quite interesting. And I, you know, you wonder what those soldiers chained to him there. They, they probably got six hour shifts chained to Paul. And they, they watch him writing this kind of stuff. And they're thinking, hmm, <laughs> what's going on in this man's mind? I wonder if some of them didn't even learn that this is the very man who wanted single handedly to stop this nonsense called Christianity and for it he's ready to die now. I yeah. mean, well, wow, I'm sure this is what changed many of their hearts. I'm, sh I'm sure Paul told them his story. Yeah, there you are, right? Yeah. How, yeah. yeah. How powerful. I was a Roman citizen. Yes. I got the best education available to Jews. Right. I was a Pharisee. I was in the Sanhedrin. Right. And I now, wanted to stop this. And now look at me. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow. 
Paul recognized that Jesus is the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior in whom we have our own deliverance from our sins, and by whom we are gone to have our final resurrection. We're going to have our final resurrection from the grave. Much of the book of Ephesians is what could be described as praise theology. That would be especially true of Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, as we noted earlier. Gordon? For Paul. Right. Oh, it's okay. For Paul, God is not a mere, excuse me, not a mere concept. Rather, God is our Father, our Creator, our Savior. This same God is full of love and might, justice and grace. He always is ready to protect us and to save us. He always is ready to give us gifts and blessings so that we may enjoy our lives to the fullness in His kingdom. And now, in the, excuse me, now and in the future, how could Paul write about such a God and about, excuse me, about his great salvation without bursting into joyful praises from the Bible study guide. Once again, remember that Paul wrote this letter from, from house arrest, potentially waiting for his execution. He woke up every morning wondering if he would have his head chopped off that day. But not being fearful though. Well, if I go today, I go. Well, he'd been through a lot already. That's right. Paul recognized that the blessings God is offering us are not just material blessings here on this earth. Okay, Jennifer. From the Bible Study Guide. For Paul, salvation is a process that takes place on a universal scale. Paul takes us to the dizzying heights of the Eporanius. Eporanius eporinius, or heavenly realms. The Greek word eporinius has several meanings. On the one hand, it means spiritual or godly, as opposed to earthly or sinful. See John 3 and Hebrews 3. On the other hand, the word refers to spatial dimensions from 1 Corinthians. Paul also combines both the spatial and the spiritual dimensions of the word eporinius together. For instance, the eporinians Eperinius in Ephesians 1 verse 3 seems to refer to a spiritual reality. That is, God blesses us with the blessings that are found in Christ. However, in the same chapter, Paul describes heaven as a spatial realm other than the earth. In Ephesians 1:20, Paul relates the Eperinius to Christ's ascension to the throne of God. Paul's heavenly places, thus, are not some ethereal, neoplatonic spheres describing the immaterial divine world to which our incorporeal, disembodied spirit allegedly travels after death. Okay, that's a very sophisticated mm -hmm. way to yeah. say we're not going to spend our future t times floating on a cloud playing a harp. <laughs> okay. So what did Paul mean when he talked about the heavens or the heavenly places? From the Bible Study Guide, considering the larger biblical context, the notion of heavenly places is a very rich biblical concept. On the one hand, quote, the heavens, end quote, refers to the entire universe that God created, and there are several references, with all of its magnificent beauty. On the other hand, the Bible depicts another meaning of the, open quote, heavens, closer to Paul's meaning in Ephesians, in which the apostle relates the heavenly pa relates the heavenly places with creation and salvation. When God created the universe, he did not remain outside the universe. The Bible does not espouse deism. Rather, God chose to enter the universe as its creator, provider, and king, and to establish a special personal relationship with the beings he created in his image. This relationship is accomplished in various ways. One is his omnipresence. God was and is present throughout the universe. This idea means that we can pray to God anywhere, in any situation, and he hears us in real time. Amazing. Nature's study guide, page 28. Yeah. I think we're starting to get a clear understanding of that given the the kind of communication that's going on in the world today. You know, we're, we, we sit down from, uh, comfortably in front of the television and we're watching people going from all parts of the world. Oh, 
And here we're looking at London, and now we're looking at Singapore, and now we're looking at you know, Moscow, and now we're looking at New York, and we think, oh, well, that's no problem. But imagine the incredible circuitry and so forth that it requires to put that all together. And that's just, I mean, that's nothing compared to what God can do. Paul recognized that the rebellion that started the great controversy happened not here on this earth, but rather it began right in the throne room of heaven next to God. And of course, that's recorded in Revelation 12, 7 to 12, where it's spelled out most clearly. Considering all the praise about God, the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, that Paul raises in the book of Ephesians, how could we ever be, folk, ever, ever be foolish enough to choose Satan's side? And considering the talk about um, evolution that goes on in our world today and how many people believe in it, uh, a, f a man that I respect greatly once said, um, after reading a, uh, James 2, verse 22, where it says, the devils also believe and tremble when they think about God, he said, even the devil is not stupid enough to be an evolutionist. <laughs> <laughs> it's also heard that he, Satan was the first first evolutionist. He just thought that God evolved to this position, and then he built a barrier to keep everybody else from arriving there. So that's okay. another, another take yeah. on it. There's another interesting electrical illustration that helps us to understand the position that Jesus took toward us. In the past, numerous people died from accidental domestic electrocution. Modern houses are equipped with an ingenious protective device, device called Ground Fault Circuit Interrupter, GFCI. The GFCI sends any difference in the current in the system and interrupt the electrical current circuit in a matter of milliseconds. In this way, if a child plugs a metallic object into an outlet, the circuit interrupter will activate and stop the current and save the child from death. God planned and created our world and, and crowned it with intelligent and free humans who could choose to reject God and could choose to sin. The consequences of sin, like the consequences of the um, touching, a life. touching of an electrical wire, result in the death of the sinner. God, could, God told Adam and Eve, if they die in the normal, in the moment or day that they had sinned, Genesis 2, 17, yet they did not die. Charles, I'm going to have to interrupt yes, here because we're, we're running out of, uh, out of time. Out of time right? We have marvelous things in this book still to learn. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, as we dig a little deeper into this brief but potent book written by Paul, help us to understand as far as we're able these messages is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.